Good morning. Uh, give a second for everybody to get connected. I still see people are connecting to audio. I hope you can hear me. I'll give it another second or two. Okay, well, um, I'm Ed Bass and we are the uh, Master Gardeners of Amador County. And this is our second season of presenting classes online. Um, I hope you've uh, come to our classes before and have enjoyed them and thank you for coming today. Today's presentation is about weeds that we love to hate, um, mainly the um, uh, yellow star cyst, stars, oh, I'm not gonna say that, star cystle. <laughs> And um, <laughs> the, the um, oh, help me out, Ann. Um, this, uh, what'd you say? Oblong spurge. Oblong spurge, yes. So uh, first a couple of bits of housekeeping and then I'll introduce our speakers. Today's program is being recorded and will be um, posted on our uh, Facebook page. Uh, and our, on our website. I posted a link to our website in the chat so you can uh, click on that and save that link. Uh, you'll find on that page a calendar for our upcoming classes. And uh, later you'll find that uh, there'll be a link posted to this, this uh, presentation. Hey, John, the next slide. Okay, I'm in control. And if you have a gardening question, you can um, ask us. This is what we do as the Master Gardeners of Amador County. If you're not in Amador County, uh, there's probably a Master Gardener uh, group in your county. So you can do a search for um, Master Gardener and your county name. Let's say Master Gardener of Alameda County and Master Gardener Humboldt County or, or whatever. But we're the Master Gardeners of Amador. And if you live in Amador County, there's our phone number and our email and our Facebook page, three different ways you can contact us and ask us uh, gardening questions. Somebody will get back to you. Well, today we have John Otto, who's one of our master gardeners and um, Anne uh, Heisenbutel. Uh, she, she's another master gardener and, and a uh, forester. And they're gonna talk to us about um, weeds and what to do about them. So go, take it away, John. Yes, good morning, uh, everyone, uh, or good day, depending on what time you're gonna really watch this live. Um, again, I'm John Otto, and with me is Ann Heisenbutel with the Amateur County Master Gardeners Program. Uh, before we actually get into weeds we love to hate, I uh, wanna remind everybody that uh, follows us that we have a grafting class every year, uh, usually a hands-on kind of class that happens in February. Uh, it's an opportunity to work with putting different vi varieties of fruit on some of your existing fruit trees. That class comes up February 13th, where you can see the notice on the screen here. And there's also a link that gets you to that calendar. But prior to that class, this is January uh, 2021. Now and last month uh, are the good times to actually create scion wood. So I'm going to take a, just a couple seconds here, uh, thanks to Dennis Miller and go through how you collect and store scion wood so that when we do grafting sometime after February, March, or April, you have that wood in storage, that, that variety. So the first thing you need to do is actually find it from your neighbors or friends, what kind of fruit trees or grapes you want to do some grafting with this, this spring. Um, if you need to go out and look for wood on those variety of trees that are about a quarter to three, quarters of an inch in diameter, okay, that you can do your grafting with. Uh, usually the wood is the last year's wood, so it's, you know, nice, fresh, uh, kind of reddish color. 
Same with grapes, it'll have kind of a reddish color uh, for the wood. You want to cut one end at an angle, okay, for the, for the grapes, and then the other end kind of blunt. That gives you an idea of which is up for grape scions. Otherwise, sometimes it's a little more, it's a little confusing. For apple, pears, peach, cherries, those kind of fruit trees, the orientation of the buds uh, are, are a lot more obvious. Um, so you just need to make sure your cuttings of a quarter inch to three quarter inch wood has about you know two or three buds at least per graft. Now you can preserve a longer cutting, you can, you know, an 18 inch cutting. And then later, you know, when you're gonna do the grafting, you'll cut it into smaller sections. So uh, you take your, your cuttings of the wood that you wanna do on the variety, wrap it in some newspaper, uh, label it with the variety, very important, because uh, you don't wanna forget whether you're putting a Fuji on your tree or you're actually putting a graven steed. Uh, so put a label on it, moisten the paper, okay? Put it in a plastic bag, a newspaper bag, or a, a, a bread bag, and put it in a part of your refrigerator. Uh, the meat keeper section is a good spot. If the keeper is not long enough, and, and you want to do the width of the shelf of your refrigerator because you have a longer cutting, so be it. Okay, we're done with how to collect scion. I hope that was quick and clear enough, okay? So here we are, weeds we love to hate. Um, we have a couple that we're going to focus on mainly, but uh, of the many weeds we have, uh, we need to identify what you classify as a weed. We're going to be talking mostly about invasives, but any plant that's not what you want, it's a weed to you, right? The ones we're talking about, which are invasive, they tend to be very competitive, choke out the existing natures. They have uh, dominant seed production. Uh, they're kind of overpowering. So you know what we're talking about. When I say something's invasive, you know what we're talking about. So the impacts uh, for that are basically that they're being detrimental to our crops. Uh, they take up our, 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 our land. Uh, they kill other native species, even if it's like a, a mistletoe or something like that. Um, and they cover uh, an area that hides pests more so than the, a lot of natives do. Uh, and oftentimes they bring in some uh, uh, pollens that we're not used to that might cause people to be more reactive to. Okay, here's a short list. There is a, a University of California Cooperative Extension a publication out that has a very, very long list. And then there's another tracking one. We have about 30 weeds, but here's just a couple you might recognize. So Anne's gonna go through some that you would recognize. So we're going to start with St. John's wort, the common name also called Klamath weed. This is uh, was planted as an ornamental and spreads pretty, um, pretty easily and it's hard to get rid of when you don't want it. Um, Medusa head, a grass that um, can be really hard on our dogs. And, they don't like that one and you don't want it to get in their ears or anything else like a foxtail and it spreads aggressively. Goat grass is another one commonly known as barbed goat grass because of the barbs that um, will cause that seed head to go into the skin or um, okay hedge parsley this one is one I find everywhere around my property in Pine Grove it's very common in the upcountry um, the little seed heads are like Velcro and they will stick to your socks and your shoelaces and your dog's fur. So um, very hardy. Puncture vine. This one can put a hole in your bicycle tire and, <laughs> yeah. and it's uh, very aggressive as well. Next one. Scotch broom, we also have French broom and Spanish broom growing all around the area here in the foothills and lots of it in the Bay Area and across the state. Um, very common along roadways, aggressive, and the seeds uh, survive for 25 to 80 years. It came from Central Europe and uh, it will colonize open areas and just outcompete everything. Tree of Heaven is another very aggressive weed. Um, came from China, I believe, and it's very common along our roadways. Uh, once you have one tree, 
it will spread aggressively and there will be more and more and it's not easy to get rid of. So the, the tree of heaven is, is one that I particularly dislike because it, it looks like a nice hedgerow, uh, but it, again, it's so pervasive, it's very, very hard to get rid of it. We're not gonna talk anymore about it, but very often we see uh, people who ask us about the blackberries and we have to remind them that the Himalayan blackberry that we see a lot of is an invasive. It outperforms uh, and, and chokes out our native California blackberry. So people say, well, okay, I like to go pick blackberries. What am I getting? Let me give you just two slides here of the difference between a Himalayan and a California blackberry. So a California blackberry, which is a native, uh, has a three leaf uh, arrangement versus a Himalayan blackberry has a five leaf. You can see that there. And the flowers, uh, when they bloom, uh, are long and thin for a California blackberry where they're more uh, rounded and uh, compact for the Himalayan. Uh, the thorns on a Himalayan are very, very large compared to the California, and so are the canes, the stems. And the fruit on the California is smaller than the Himalayan, uh, so that's why people like the Himalayan. I guess you get more berries for your buck uh, with the Himalayan. Uh, but the Californias have a kind of a unique flavor, slightly different, maybe not quite as juicy as the Himalayan, but still very attractive. So those are the ways you can tell the difference between the California and the imported in invasive Himalayan. So let's get to the basis of our class, which we're going to talk about Oglong Spurge, which is Anne's passion, and Yellow Star Thistle, which is my passion. Okay, next slide, John. Oops. Oh, I'm sorry. We just, yeah, we're going to get there. We go. All right, oblong spurge. Uh, it's also called um, egg leaf spurge or Balkan spurge, but commonly known as oblong. Um, it's related to a number of spurge plants that are invasive and many that are ornamental. Um, poinsettia is a spurge plant that is not a problem in our gardens, but um, I'll explain to you why oblong spurge is uniquely problematic for us. It comes from Turkey and Southeastern Europe. And next slide, Joey. I'm sorry. That's all I'm right. asleep over here. All right, the, <clears throat> the flowers are produced in clusters at the branch tips. Uh, it blooms from the spring into the through the summer. And those seeds will continue to, um, to mature as the, flowers, um, as the flowers continue to bloom. So it will be seeding for much of the year. It reproduces not only by seed, but also by vegetative buds from the root crown. And the seeds, when they ripen, they can eject from the plant up to 16 feet. So you can see why it will spread readily just by seed. They're also sticky and animals can carry the seed on their coats. Um, the seeds remain viable for eight years in the soil. And you can see in the lower picture, the root system is uh, very sturdy. If you try just to pull the plant, you're going to only cultivate it because every time you break that stem or that root, it will create new buds and continue to grow. Oops, wrong way there. So we have the range and the legal, oh, I'm sorry, I skipped one. Um, range and legal status. It is found in damp meadows along stream banks, shady woodlands, dry hillsides, roadsides, and burned areas. And of course we have all of that in Amador County. And you can see from the map, in California, it has spread quite a bit uh, along the coast and here in the in central part of the state, uh, in the foothills. And it's also in Oregon and Washington. So the California Department of Food and Agriculture has classified it as a class B noxious weed. That means counties may undertake control uh, and eradication efforts if they choose. In Washington and Oregon, it's considered a class A where um, it's, it's in more limited 
range and they are trying to eradicate it. And it is mandated when um, oblong spurge is found to contain and eradicate it. The California Invasive Plant Council also keeps a list of invasive weeds and classifies them. And for this one, they call it limited because its distribution is not, um, not widespread throughout the whole state, but they recognize that locally it can be very persistent and problematic. So the impact, it is toxic to humans and animals, especially toxic to cattle and horses. And for humans, the white sap, if you break a stem, there's a, a white uh, latex type sap that is very caustic to our skin. If you get it in your eyes, it can cause severe eye injury. Um, the plants are spreading along the riparian areas of the Wild and Scenic McCullumney River and Jackson Creek. It's also widespread uh, along roadways, especially in the McCullumney River drainage. If, if you take uh, Red Corral Road, for example, from Highway 88 into Calaveras County, there's a lot of spurge along the roadside. And it is spreading now within areas of the Butte Fire. So um, in our county, our farm advisor, Scott Aneto, did some studies on how best to control the oblong spurge and how to do that without impacting other uh, vegetation. So he has just completed a study this year or last year. And um, I'm gonna show you some of the results from that work. So the study purpose was to evaluate control methods that can be suitable on different land ownerships, including both public land and private land and in the wildland setting. And um, how can we seek effective control of oblong spurge while minimizing impacts on other plant species? Also, everything has to be done in compliance with applicable laws and regulations. And our goal is to stop the spread and eradicate it as much as possible. So this is a photo along the McCullumney River where you can see all those pretty yellow flowers that is all oblong spurge and the native vegetation that would normally have been there, um, various herbs and forbs um, are all gone underneath those beautiful oaks. So there are a number of concerns, um, especially since um, controlling this by hand, by digging or by, by other methods is, um, is not effective. We have to think about the proximity to water, the use of um, control methods in sensitive habitats. How do we protect desirable native plants? What is the public perception and acceptance to using control methods for oblong spurge? Um, because we're going to largely have to depend on herbicide. Having that herbicide be selective and not kill everything. And also having access to the land where we need to eradicate it and getting landowner support because much of it is on private land or adjacent to private land. So, I touched briefly on the challenges of mechanical control, hand pulling or grubbing can work if you just get a, a few plants on your property, you can pull them and when they sprout, you pull them again and you just keep at it until they no longer have any life left, left in that um, aggressive root system and prevent them from going to seed. Mowing is not effective because it encourages more growth and caution needs to be taken because of that sap that you can um, get, get it on your equipment, on your hands. And then if you get it in your face, it's even worse. Um, cultivation can be partially effective if you repeat the digging it up and um, pulling it every time it regrows. And it's more effective in combination with herbicides. Grazing can be done with sheep or goats if you have them in high intensity. And, um, but you have to be very sure not to let cattle or horses uh, graze on it because that is not good for them. And cultural methods, burning is not effective because that is going to again stimulate root sprouts. So you can see it's, there's a lot of challenges. Um, 
Biological methods have been used effectively on leafy spurge, which is a very problematic weed in the Intermountain West. Um, it has taken over a lot of cropland. Um, 15 different insects have been used for control of leafy spurge, but none of them have been found to have any effect on oblong spurge. So that brings us to the chemical controls. And there are a number of chemicals that, that can be used Two of them, the first two on this list, are not registered for use in California, so they're not available. The next two, 2,4-D and dicamba, are restricted use materials. They're not available to homeowners, and there are a lot of restrictions on their use. And then we have four that um, include glyphosate, which is a common herbicide, um, and imazapur, and I'm not even going to try to pronounce the other two, um, but the imazapur is the one found most effective for oblong spurge, and it is available in um, chemical mixes available to homeowners, but it's in a very low concentrate, which is not enough to be effective to control the plant. So how do we selectively control oblong spurge? in these sensitive habitats without affecting everything else in the environment. Well, here's an example of the problem. This photo was taken up in Pioneer just off of Highway 88. There's a, a little triangular plot of land that had been completely taken over by oblong spurge. And this picture from June of 2015 shows you how, um, how pervasive it can be. Here, after several years of consecutive treatments. By June 2018, it, the spurge has been almost completely eliminated and the grasses have retaken their rightful place on this, um, in this little piece of property. So we did find something that can work. So, so that has led to a control plan, um, a project here in the county to try and eradicate it now. So 2019 and 2020, uh, the county has been mapping the spurge locations, um, especially along the McCullumney River Basin and um, fo focusing largely there, but also trying to identify where else it is. Uh, during those two years, the county applied and received funding through the California Department of Food and Agriculture to conduct a study. and. Um, We've also collaborated with agency partners to get herbicide approval. And then in June of 2020, uh, the county trained the Ag Department biologists on application techniques. So beginning this month, January through June of this year, the county is going to have a public outreach program to inform the public about oblong spurge, um, raise our awareness and help us to help them locate more um, places that need treatment. Beginning in April, hopefully, and through September, the plan is to treat the spurge countywide. And then from September through June of 2022, revisit those sites and retreat them as, as needed. So what does that involve? The treatment needs to be done by certified applicators. Um, because the imazapur that is going to be used is of a higher concentration than, than we can use as homeowners ourselves. So imazapur is used in um, treating undesirable vegetation in forestry sites, aquatic sites, grass pastures, rangelands, fence rows, wildlife openings. It's, it's really safe to use in all those different conditions. Um, it's effective both for post and pre-emergent control. So it will kill the plant after it has started to grow. And also it will have an effect on the root system um, under, underneath the soil. It is labeled for caution, which means um, a lot of caution needs to be used when, um, when using the herbicide, wearing per personal protective equipment and, um, and other methods, gloves and goggles and all of that. And it's used in conjunction with an, a vegetable oil concentrate, which helps with the application. 
you can see in this photo, this is a sprayer here with a backpack and a sprayer, and it will be sprayed at two gallons per acre. So there's not a lot of material needed uh, to cover an acre of ground. The study conclusions determined that inv this invasive um, oblong spurge can be selectively controlled using imazapur, which is a non-selective herbicide. That means anything you spray with it might be killed, but it is done selectively by using a drizzle application where you are pointing your spray on the target plant. And that has advantages over a broadcast spray, which would cover the whole, um, you know, everything on the ground by reducing drift, preventing off-site movement, um, it gives high accuracy and a low risk of hitting your non-target species. So here is a road bank on the left in June, 2020, you can see the yellow flowers of the oblong spurge and the, the second photo in July, one month later where the spurge that was sprayed has been killed and the other plants are not affected. Here's another example where spurge was growing among grapes and the spurge was sprayed with this drizzle method. The grapes were not sprayed and, and they are doing fine. So the public outreach is going to involve the county agriculture department sending out a mailer. This flyer, this is a photo of the flyer. Um, it's not meant for you to read every line on there, um, but just so you know, if you receive this in the mail, please pay attention. We want to help stop the spread. Uh, the Amador County grant from the state is going to fund treatments by our county agriculture department. It will require landowner permission and it's at no cost to the landowner. And the contacts, as I mentioned early on, will begin this winter with this flyer that will be sent to landowners who live in the area where oblong spurge occurs. And it will include a consent form that landowners need to return if they want the county to help control the spurge. And we hope that they will. Um, so to help slow the spread, if you have questions about oblong spurge, if you think you have it on your property and you wanna notify the county, you can contact the uh, Amador County Department of Agriculture at this phone number or website. If you're from another county, contact your local Department of Agriculture. They may be um, wanting the same information and, and you can encourage them to help you to control the oblong spurge. And there's also a really cool website, calflora.org, where you can go to that website, um, register, and then you can map locations where you know the oblong spurge or other weeds for that matter occur and the county will be using that data also as they work to um, eradicate oblong spurge. So with that we're going to turn to yellow star thistle. I'm going to let John take over and then we'll take questions on all of this at the end. Thank you. Man. Um, yeah, oblong spurge, that sticky gooey uh, sap, it has a beautiful flower but that sap just makes you, drives you crazy on the skin. And I didn't realize it was so toxic to an animals. Uh, so this is going to get on my list again as one of the top two uh, invasive plants. But I'm gonna talk a little bit about yellow star thistle. I can't imagine anybody who's uh, viewing this class has, in, ha has not seen this invasive weed. Now in California, there's a lot of thistles, okay? And a lot of them are, are native. There's a purple thistle, uh, there's a variety of thistles, but this is a unique one, and it's unique in that it doesn't have uh, spiny leaves, it has a spiny head. So what is it? Why do we care? What are we going to do about it? And when can we do it? Um, so this is a, an invasive that came in the mid-1800s uh, from Eurasia, and uh, it, is, it was brought in with, with feed and other kinds of things that were shipped around the horn. Or, or directly across. Uh, and it's uh, gotten to be pretty invasive to the point where some people have just thrown up their hands and say, ah, oh, we can't deal with it. But if you live anywhere where this is at, 
you want to deal with it. You want to find a way to take care of it. Uh, invite, you know, we, we probably have about 18 million acres of land in California alone that is uh, uh, covered by this, this invasive plant. And the reason it's invasive is it puts out a lot of seeds. Uh, it can over uh, germinate for, for many years of those seeds until it gets water. Every time we have a rain, those seeds will germinate. So the ones that didn't germinate in the last rain will start to germinate in the next rain. So it has a long growing season. Um, it, it, its tap roots are very deep. So it tends to uh, reach deep into the, the, the soils. Uh, you, you know it's a yellow star thistle, not only by the seed head, which is laid in it, by its unique stem. It's kind of kind of blue green fluted kind of stem uh, that becomes very obvious uh, in, in, the, in the growing season. When it's very young and, and the earlier, it's just a broad leaf, it could look like a dandelion. You wouldn't notice it much different, uh, although the leaves are different. Uh, but as it grows up into the bolting stage, you can really identify it with this blue green. You can get rid of it then if, you, if you're uh, of the inclination to do so. Uh, the, the mature plant can get to be pretty tall, uh, four or five feet. Mostly what you have seen around in pastures or along the road to the side are probably less than four feet, okay? But uh, it, in, the, in the wild by itself, it'll go. It loves the sun and has deep tap roots, and we've talked about it. So why do we care? Well, for the same reason we care about a lot of invasives that we want to try and get rid of, uh, they eliminate our, our use of land. Uh, either for crops or for grazing and or for our recreational use. Uh, it blocks out the existing uh, uh, plant life, okay? Um, and it's toxic. Now, if you think oblong spurge is to toxic, uh, yellow star thistle, at least for horses, can be so toxic as to be terminal. Uh, it creates a what they call a chewing disease. The more the horse eats, the more he wants to eat. It's kind of addictive, uh, but it has a neurotoxin impact and uh, it's fatal to horses. Not cattle and not goats and not uh, sheep, but uh, for horses. Let's see. So again, why do we care? Uh, well, if, if you don't care whether the land is being eliminated from use, you might want to be worried about water. Now we're in a kind of a dry year so far. And in, in California, drought is always on our minds. Uh, so the tap roots on, on a yellow star thistle is very deep. Uh, the ones you pick up at your property and pull out by the, by the stem may not seem so deep, but they're, as you can see in this illustration, are examples that get very, very long. And they take a lot of water. Now think about this, if 15 to 25% of your annual rainfall on your yard, okay, or your one acre, 15 to 25% of that is being sucked up by an invasive. That's, if you're on a well, that takes away from your well, in addition to what it takes away from the normal grasses and ground cover that we like or that we harvest. So that's a lot of water. 15 billion gallons, it was estimated, came and was eliminated from just the Sacramento River watershed area in, in one year. That's, that's, a, that's a lot of water. So even if you don't mind the spines and whatnot, think about water conservation. Well, what are we gonna do about it? Well, one of the first things you wanna do is keep it from spreading. And uh, because it's so spiny, uh, it sticks to your clothes. But that's probably not a huge transmitter because you, know, you wash your clothes. Now, oblong spurge, Anne was saying, explodes and, and throws the seeds great distance. Uh, that's not true with the yellow star thistle. The, the seed head of the yellow star thistle just sort of pops and the, the, they just drop. They stay within a three to four feet area of the plant. Of course, they keep spreading four feet, 16 feet, 24, and on, on and on. Uh, but they are transmitted on things like uh, mechanical equipment, the tires of your car, your truck, or the tractor you brought in to, you know, blade some uh, manzanita down. So one of the things I recommend is you know, insist that anybody who brings equipment on your, on your property, that they've cleaned that equipment and try and be there and walk around and look 
in the, the tracks of the tractor or in the tires of the tractor uh, or equipment and make sure there's no yellow star thistle that they brought home with them or they brought to your house from theirs. Um, anyway, so what are we gonna do about it? Um, well, there's always the four, four levels of control that Ann talked about and I'm gonna go through the same four levels. Some are similar uh, that we have for yellow star thistle. First of all, you need to know what the cycle is for the yellow star thistle. I mentioned earlier that uh, the seedlings don't, don't stand out right away. Uh, and in the rosette stage, you know, it could be a dandelion. Although if you look at a dandelion and then you look at this photo here, there's significant difference. But once you're in the bolting and flowering stage, you know it's yellow star thistle. I'd be surprised in the chat room if anybody said, oh, I didn't, I haven't seen this plant before. Then uh, the mechanical control is the easiest one. You pull it. And I've done a lot of pulling. Uh, if you're familiar with the uh, area around the, um, uh, what's it called? Kennedy Mine, okay. Uh, a lot of the volunteers did a lot of pulling there before they went and used a herbicide control. But anyway, so if you see a small patch of it on your driveway that somehow got there by the mailbox, pull it before it gets stuck on the mailman's tryer and takes it to the next address and the next and the next. Um, it's pretty easy when the, like again, the, 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 like the moisture. So when you start to get in the bolting season, you get a little moisture. They don't hold too hard. You can, you can pull them. Uh, rototilling, you got to make sure you're deep enough that you're getting the roots cut. Uh, it's, it, it's, eh, it's problematic. I'm not saying don't do it. I'm saying, you know, it's probably not as good as just uh, hand pulling. And mowing is the same thing. The problem, uh, same with the oblong spurge. If you mow it, it just sort of kind of keeps everything lower. It doesn't eliminate it. Uh, we've, I've seen seed heads on uh, mowed uh, yellow star thistle literally about four inches off the ground. So when the normal plant is four to five feet, we normally see it at three or four. Uh, if you keep mowing it, uh, unless you suck up the, the heads as well uh, and burn it or whatever, uh, it'll actually just be a short yellow star thistle and still have those seed heads producing 30 plus thousand seeds per, per acre. So what else can you do? Uh, another one's grazing. And you know, I'm kind of thinking if you have a significant half acre or more, you might talk to some neighbors who might have a goat or a sheep that either you could run some portable fencing around uh, and, and move it across your land because uh, they definitely will eliminate uh, the, the, the material before it, it, the seeds. Again, because the seeds are so viable for a number of years, this is not a one-time effort. You're gonna have to you know, monitor and keep doing this for three, four years, but it is doable. I know people who's, who've been successful. Uh, cattle might not be as easy for you to do unless you're, you, know, you have a larger parcel and it's actually grazed uh, with cattle. But goats and sheep, um, that's, that's a good option. Um, the notes tell you that if you do it too early or too late, it's not as, not as useful. Burning is a great answer, except not in California uh, or not in the foothills. Uh, if you can, you might actually arrange with a, uh, a local volunteer fire department and say, hey, yeah, I got this acre and a half or whatever, or half acre. And if you want a little quick, practice time, why don't you arrange and come and uh, we'll put a little fire break around it and you can you can burn this area for us. Uh, but other than that, doing it on your own, there's some downsides to burning. Uh, hopefully it never gets out of control. And the Air Pollution Control Board has some issues with burning as well. So what else have we got going? Well, biological controls. Now, Ann talked about a number of um, uh, insects that were uh, maybe have some promise with the uh, oblong spurge. Same thing with yellow star thistle. Uh, there's been research being done the last uh, couple dozen years on trying to find uh, weevils that will take care of it. Here's a, a four weevils. Uh, if you look at the lower edge, you can actually see three of these weevils deal with the seed head. So they're not actively trying to eliminate uh, the plant. They're eliminating the seeds, which is a great thing. Uh, and you can see the little egg 
on the bottom side. Let's see if the cursor works. Cursor works. There's a leg. So that's the egg of a hairy weevil. Okay. Recently, they've been working with a uh, rosette weevil that actually attacks the, the root area, it, the base of the plant, the green at the base uh, of, the, of, the, of the root uh, area. The only problem with these are, one, they're expensive. Uh, two, they may not stay on your property, you know, just like lady beetles for pollinating uh, and, and whatnot. They don't necessarily stay on your property. They, they go to your friends. But if you're a good neighbor and you want to try and invest in weevils, give the biological control a shot. Well, I've been kind of negative about the success rate of some of the previous examples. So let's go to the herbicides. Uh, chemical control. Again, uh, yellow star thistle is pretty uh, invasive and the seeds last a long time. So it's not a one, one year shot. And the choices for herbicides are fairly limited. Uh, where Anne was talking about for oblong spurge, there was about four different herbicides that seemed to be real successful. Um, with the yellow star thistle, there are a, a number of uh, herbicides available, but they're mainly available to uh, licensed applicators, okay? For us as homeowners uh, or small property owners or whatever, you only have a couple choices. There's the glyphosate family of uh, herbicides, uh, Roundup is one of them, uh, and it's called a post-emergent. So you apply this herbicide when you see the plant, and hopefully you can do it in a spotted area, right, specific to this plant. If it's a whole area that you've got and you're trying to get rid of, then application of a, a, a post-emergent, broad-based herbicide like glyphosate, it kills just about everything. You know, the, the, the grasses as well as the broadleaf plants, the narrow leaf and the broadleaf, but it works and you can use uh, that. There's also a, another product, uh, let me back up a little bit. So when do you do a, a post-emergent? Well, when you see the plant. Uh, for yellow star thistle, which can have several generations in a wet year, it can, it can be as early as April or May. Uh, and as late as September. But fundamentally, the applications for uh, a broadleaf herbicide uh, post-emergent is June or July. And the applications are on the, on the, on the, on the, on the product. Uh, another herbicide is clopyrrolid. Clopyrrolid is in its commercial form, sometimes known as transline. Uh, because of the demand to control yellow star thistle, the, the government has allowed a smaller quantity to be uh, available to homeowners. It's, it's called star thistle killer. It's marketed by Monterey. Um, I'm not advertising anything, but that's the only one right now that has a clopyrrolid ingredient that you and I can, can apply ourselves. Uh, otherwise, we can go hire an applicator and use Transline, and I think there's another one uh, of a product uh, that does a really good job as a, uh, as a pre-emergent. And this is something you wanna do right now, uh, January, February, uh, before the uh, small seedlings become uh, bolting. So you can apply this early in the soil and it prevents the, the earlier rosettes from growing, okay? So we would be doing this now if you're gonna use a, a pre-emergent uh, herbicide called uh, Sarthesyl Killer which is a clopyrrolid, or hire an applicator that can use Transline or some of the other commercial uh, uh, pre-emergence. Hopefully that made that clear. So, you know, uh, just like now is a good time to cut your scion wood for the grafting class, now's a good time to go out and do a, a pre-emergent uh, herbicide to try and get rid of, uh, uh, and it's fairly selective. It affects a lot of broadleaves, but it will not affect the grasses. And that's important, okay? So uh, as, a, uh, as a lymphoma survivor, okay, when we talk about herbicides, I have to emphasize that, and I have no idea if my lymphoma was caused by herbicide use or glyphosate use, but it might have been. Anyway, read the label and then read the label again. Whenever you're working with herbicides or pesticides or any kinds of chemicals, uh, read the instructions and know what you're doing. I'm not advocating you don't. You know, not everything can be solved with just soap applications, okay? 
although hand pulling is good exercise. Uh, make sure you're wearing the right protective equipment, okay? Uh, avoid making your herbicides or even pesticides get into the water system, okay? Uh, avoid drift, you, you know, and don't spray things on a windy day. Uh, if, if appropriate, be, be selective. You know, know what plants you're actually spraying. Uh, Pre-emergence uh, are very good because they're usually targeted for a specific broadleaf plant uh, and not, a, not affect the grasses. Uh, but when you use a post-emergent, you're looking at the possibility of, you know, drift affecting a lot of the ornamentals or natives that you want to keep. Well, that's my sermon for the day. I read the label and I read it again. Uh, this pretty much has gotten us through oblong spurge and uh, yellow star thistle. And this is a long list of references that we've used. And actually at this point, uh, we are, look at my Kelly, we're pretty much on track, actually a little ahead of schedule, which is good. And we'd be more than happy to field questions. Uh, and that's what we're gonna do next. Thank you. Okay, um, go ahead, Ann. I was gonna say, did you wanna speak? <laughs> I'll take this Mark. slide real quick. There's a link okay. that we're looking at now um, called Help Us Grow. And this is a link to an evaluation that you can give your feedback about how you have um, changed what you do in your backyard garden or landscape after coming to our class. And this really helps us to do a better job in our community or to do the best job we can. Um, we also ask for um, race and ethnicity in this question because we are funded by the USDA. And so if you can just follow this link and complete a quick survey for us, that would be extremely helpful. Thank you folks and we'll go back to questions. Okay, sorry about that, Tracy. I forgot your intermission there. Okay, um, we have a few questions in the chat, so please put them there if you do have uh, any additional ones. First one comes from Kimberly. Um, what about natural vinegar-based herbicides? Uh, okay, uh, yes, there's, um, you know, we talk about doing the least invasive uh, treatments uh, before you get to the most in, uh, invasive treatments, just like uh, we, we have for the plants themselves. So yes, an herbicide is, is at a upper level of treatment. We always like to try things like getting rid of aphids by just spraying water on them, okay? And then we try uh, soaps and, and things like that. For yellow star thistle, um, the vinegar home remedy uh, doesn't work. Boiling hot water, <clears throat> don't know that the long-term it's gonna help. You couldn't do a quarter acre or, or a big garden with just hot water or vinegar. Uh, it, it's, not, it's not long lasting enough and toxic enough to get to the, to the root system. That's my opinion. Uh, but I would still say, you know, if you only have something around the mailbox or something, uh, you know, that is sort of along the roadside of your driveway, uh, yes, you can try hot water, you can try the vinegar solutions all of these kind of remedies and feedback to us what kind of suggestion you, what kind of successes you have. Um, again, uh, the people I know that have tried some of this, not a lot of success, but that's not to mean you shouldn't try it. I don't know about how long sir, Dan. I, I am certain that vinegar or other home remedies would not be very effective on oblong spurge. It just has two, uh, sturdy a uh, root system that you're not going to impact that and uh, you may not stimulate growth like you do you know if you're just pulling pulling the weeds I, I can say that I have um, volunteered at Indian Grinding Rock State Park and we have oblong spurge there and I've done a lot of pulling a um, number of years in a row and it, it's true that we've cultivated it. Um, we've not gotten rid of it. So we've kept the plants smaller, so that may be an advantage, but we've not been able to get rid of them. And vinegar is not going to be any more effective than that. Okay. 
Thank you. Next question. Um, I'm I think I missed it. Is there a way for me to see the chat? Gloria. Yeah, I, I, I'll give you the questions, John. Is it okay. safe to use yellow star thistle in an area where we want to plant vegetables? How long do we have to wait before planting vegetables if we spray glyphosate? Glyphosate. Uh, that's a very good question. Um, glyphosate, you have to read the label. I'm trying to remember, and somebody smarter than me would uh, know what the, the downtime is once you've treated um, a, a, a post-emergent, non-selective herbicide like glyphosate. Um, my recollection, well, I, I hate to say my recollection, that's kind of unsafe, uh, but I've, I've planted uh, new products like uh, new, new vegetables or new or ornamentals uh, in areas that I that treated before uh, within the next 12 months. Uh, glyphosate doesn't stay bound in the soil forever. So it's not a, like some of the things you see around the telephone poles uh, that pg e uses, I forget what they're using. Um, th those are uh, an herbicide that have three or four year uh, active life of sterilizing the soil. Uh, glyphosate's probably out within within 12 to 14 months, 16 months. Uh, let's see, we just got, oh, I see somebody hooked me to chat and I don't see the other parts, but that's okay. Do you? We'll let Laurie yeah, we'll let, um, we'll let somebody ask the question. Did you want to jump in on that in terms of? Yeah. Okay. Okay, Joan, if you could clarify your question, I see milestone question mark, and I'm not sure what that means as a question. Um, and while we're waiting for that, let me go on to Rhonda. I'm concerned about glyphosate. Is that how you say it, John? Leaching sure. into our well water. I am attending this class to find alternatives. Um, I think I will try a pre-emergent. Is this sold locally at garden centers or Lowe's? Yeah, I want to get... I, I want to, let's see, I want to get out of this chat screen, share screen. Hold on a second. Okay, I'm, I'm back. Um, yes, that, that, for the yellow star thistle killer by Monterey, um, I saw it at Sally's up at uh, Ridge Nursery Garden Center uh, last year. I hope she stocks some of it. It's a little pricey, but the small little container will do a couple acres. So I think it's in the $40 range. I have seen it at Ace and Jackson. I've not seen it elsewhere in the county, uh, but I know Chris at Ace uh, uh, stocks it, and uh, Sally did last year, and I think she might this year. Uh, and, and it was pretty successful from, from the reports that I've had. Okay, next question. Um, do you have a recommendation for a good sprayer for applying to an acre size area? I have a little two gallon sprayer from Home Depot and find it very slow. Um, no, I don't have any recommendations of spray. I, well, I do have one recommendation. Uh, in, in using sprayers, I've found that the plastic nozzles um, don't last as long as the, the brass ones, okay? And the dispersal heads on the plastic ones are not as good as the brass ones. But all that being said, uh, if you're talking about five gallons or less uh, sprayers, um, you know, if, if you're saying it's not applying it well, maybe there's a little plug in it, or, you know, a little dirty. I, it's hard to know. I don't have any favorites. Ann, do you have any comments? Yeah. No, I, I don't do that kind of work. I let my husband do it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And then I Joan, I think I've got your Sorry, I'm question the clarified. Go ahead, Ann. I was gonna say, I, I do a lot of weed pulling rather than using the spray. Okay. So if I understand Joan's question, Milestone is a product that she has bought but hasn't used it yet and wants to know if it's restricted in any way. Um. 
Tracy should weigh in on this. Does my understand Milestone is uh, only uh, available for our licensed uh, or certified applicators? Uh, I don't know that I've never been able to acquire it. Um, I think Tracy could jump in on this real quickly. Uh, I think Milestone is one of those listed uh, strictly for licensed applicators. Let me do some quick research and I'll put it in the chat. Yeah, okay. But again, uh, okay. if, you have, if the question is actually coming from somebody who's legitimately able to apply Milestone, uh, yeah, that's a, that's a, Milestone is a uh, post-emergent and it is a uh, uh, non-selective. Okay, this next question is for Ann. Um, what does oblong spurge look like at this time oh, of yeah. year? Well, I anticipated this question and I picked this on Wednesday. It's been sitting in my car. Um, see if I can show you so you can see. see. This, the soil was nice and wet and it was easy to get some of the roots out. So you can see that. It's not a very, um, doesn't have very many leaves on it right now, but you can see the, the rosettes of the flowers were here at the top. It has the leaf, the leaf actually looks a little bit like, um, like a broom leaf, especially when the plant is small. But if you pick the leaf or break the stem and see the white sap, you'll know it's oblong spurge. Dan, can you um, maybe do full screen so people can see that a little better? Well, let's full screen, full screen. John's in charge of the computer. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. Let's see. We'll, we'll do our best, Lisa, to do that. Yeah. For the folks at home, you click on speaker view, and that will allow you to see the person that's speaking closer. And that's in the right hand corner. That looks great, Ann. Yeah. Okay, so, go ahead, Ann. Yeah. So some of the plants that um, that are growing along my road have a lot more leaves on them than this one right now. Uh, or more of the flower structures still remaining. But um, you can see the red color of the stem, maybe, if I could bring it closer. The, Perfect, the stem, yeah. The stem is kind of tan with a red tinge to it, and that is also a common characteristic. I hope that helps. Yeah, no. I'm just going to stay in this format. Well, we're supposed to be six feet apart. Oh, that's it. <laughs> okay. We're trying to keep our distance okay. from each other. Is this the video format we want to use now, uh, Doris? Yes. Okay. Next question. Um, Jennifer, I don't have access to the email you sent in. Um, Tracy, I don't know if you saw that one, a weed seed. We'll have to get back to you on that one. And, and uh, Laura, I can show you, I have the picture. I have it right here, if you can see it. Uh, let's see here. That, see that thing? Uh, no. It's all over my my backyard. It's like a twisty, twirly thing. Oh, 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 yes. Uh, what is that? <laughs> uh, what's that called? Uh, and I have so many of these. And so I want to know what weed it turns into. I don't know. And I want to make sure I can kill it. <laughs> oh, what is that called? I, I recognize it and I can't think of the name. Yes. Um, can we'll, you we'll get back to your email on okay. that one. Yeah. Thank you. It does oh, look somebody kind of knows, Roland. I think it's Fillory. Fillory, that, that is correct. Right. Say it again. Fillory, Storksville. How do you spell it? Oh, I think it's F-I-L-A-R-E. Or Storksville is the common name. Okay, um, thank you. All right. Well, I have 10 o'clock. Doris, are we? And I don't see any more questions. We're in good shape. Okay. okay. Are there any more questions? Uh, Roland? Yeah, I got on really late, and I'm sorry. 
Uh, I'm working with the habitat management and restoration group out at the new Bass Lake Regional Park here in El Dorado Hills. Bass Lake. And okay. just going to throw that out for the general folks listening. We do have uh, star thistle uh, that we're going to need to eradicate there, but we have lots of other projects going on. Well, uh, can you share with us what what your your game plan is for the uh, treatment and uh, elimination of the yellow star thistle? Boy Scouts, uh, okay. as it starts to become apparent, just prior to maybe during flowering, or again, we'll try to do it when the soil is moist enough that they can yank some of it. Were you aware that the oblong spurge, there was a California program uh, for it? No, I was not aware. Okay, so this might be good information that your group could, uh, you know, research and see if in, you said Bass Lake, so that's Cal Sacramento County. Sacramento County, El Dorado County. Uh, El Dorado, okay. They, they may have a program similar to what our, uh, uh, the Ag Department's gonna do in Amador County. It'd be worth checking. If, if you came in late, Anne had been talking about a program for oblong spurge in Amador County, it might be in other counties as well. Yeah, our, our, our farm advisor, Scott Onetto, uh, got a grant for Amador County to control uh, oblong spurge here. Okay. okay. I'd like to, I have a little bit of information about spillery for the last question. Um, our weed book, which is weeds, forages, and natives of the Central Sierra region, for anybody who is interested, um, says about fillery, control is often not needed as fillery is considered a desirable forage. Hand pulling is effective on seedlings and young plants before flowering and seed production. So that was for our last question. Okay, let me see if we've got more. Uh, here we go. What was the first choice of herbicide, herbicide for star thistle? Well, it, actually my first is called star thistle killer. It's clopyrrolid, that's the active ingredient. And it's a pre-emergent, something you would do now before the, well, before we hopefully get more moisture and, and uh, a lot of broadleaf plants uh, start to grow. The reason it's my preference is because it's a pre-emergent and you can, and it does not affect grasses, it's just a, a broadleaf uh, selective. Uh, and again, but the clopyrrolid, unless you're using a commercial applicator, uh, is only available in a small quantity, but the small concentrate for 40 bucks or more is uh, good for a couple acres. So that concentrate, a small little pint, is uh, is good for a couple acres. That's that's a lot for people like me. Uh, so clopyrrolid would be my first choice. Do it now as a pre-emergent. Later on, uh, then stuff that comes up as a spot, you know, do spot treatment with a glyphosate. You know, your your Roundup or Best or whatever product that has glyphosate in it. And those are my only two herbicide choices, uh, but it's also a good time to start pulling. And what's the best time to spray for uh, oblong spurge? Um, the spurge, you want to, well, the imazapur is, is both a post-emergent and a pre-emergent. Pre okay. So you can spray, um, you can spray, I guess, any time, but I think Scott found it most effective in the early summer. Okay. I'd have to check with, with Scott, our farm advisor, for more on that. But um, as I mentioned earlier, the imazapur solution that they found most effective for oblong spurge has to be done by a licensed applicator. And that's why the Amador, Amador County Agriculture Department will be doing the spraying um, where the landowner gives them permission. Okay, uh, any hints for getting rid of Himalayan blackberry? Yeah, I've done that. It's a, a, it's pretty aggressive. It has a thick, it has a thick cane, uh, and I just got rid of some of it in, in uh, north, uh, 
North Main Street of Jackson. Uh, again, it, it responds to a, uh, uh, well, I don't know about Pulpira, but it responds to glyphosate, okay? Uh, again, if, if it's an area because it's a shrub, uh, you can start to cut it back. And in Sutter Creek, uh, 15 years ago, uh, I was able to cut it, burn it, and then the stuff that came back, I used glyphosate uh, Roundup, uh, and it was really pretty successful. There's actually, uh, that's been more than 12 years, and there's only a few canes that have started to come back. Uh, but uh, the blackberries, even California blackberries, all blackberries are, are pretty uh, hardy, okay? But yes, the first thing is you got to get back to where you have some new growth that you can use on herbicide. So cutting and hauling, which is scary because the thorns just tear you up, is your first effort. Yeah. You can't really, you would use an awful lot of product to actually just try and spray it and hope it to die back because the spray won't actually get to the lower growth and you get new growth all the time. So you've got to do a cutting job to get rid of any of the blackberries uh, first, uh, hopefully in an area where you can burn the pile rather than try and haul it. Because the closer you get to those thorns, they're all nasty, no matter whether it's a Himalayan blackberry, the large thorn, or the California blackberry, which are finer thorns. Okay, next question. Any tips for getting rid of Oxalis wood sorrel? Oh, I don't. I don't have any experience with oxalis. Um, while we're thinking about it, Anne's going to quickly look up in the. Uh, oh, it's not in there, oxalis. I'm going to post into the chat a UC IPM link for wood sorrel, and you might notice a pattern here when you're asking about um, different weeds. I'm posting UC IPM. That's University of California integrated pest management. And then you put in your uh, problematic, so if it is sorrel, you'd put in a, a search, UCIPM sorrel. And then that would come up and it gives you control ideas and, and just how to manage these things in our backyards. If you have, and if, if, if you have the references from the PowerPoint that we just gave as a class, you will see that IPM is often the source of our information as well as uh, for these, these weeds, as well as many, many other uh, products. Well, the first go-to resource uh, website you should have is the IPM website from UC Davis. Okay, and uh, I think this is gonna be our last question from George. Instead of buying tons of potting soil, I like to use my regular garden soil. Problem is there are tons of little weed seeds in the soil, and I mean tons. Can I make those seeds non-viable somehow without using herbicides, heat, microwave, other? Um, solarization has been one thing a couple of friends of mine like to do, uh, whether they're using their existing soil or others, is to solarize it. Um, and if you're using it for like potting soil, you probably don't care that in solarizing, we would also get rid of some uh, grubs and worms and other uh, nutrients in the soil, but it would kill a lot of the uh, seeds. Now, some seeds are really tenacious. Like, I don't think solarization will kill many of yellow star thistles. For example, those people have said, well, if I solarized my yard where I had yellow star thistle, would that take care of it? Those seeds will stay dormant for a long time and that wouldn't be the answer. But for the specific question about potting soil, you know, the seeds that you get off out of it, I think you could try solarizing it. You know, take a, a couple, uh, four inches of it, spread it out, cover it with white plastic or clear plastic, and uh, let it sit for a, a month or so. Um, again, this is not exactly a University of California property extension uh, response. Uh, um, maybe uh, Laurie will put this into a, uh, a contact sheet type question and get back to this uh, viewer. 
mm -hmm. um, with a little little more definitive answer? Uh, actually, um, Tracy has put the IPM um, pest note regarding so solarization in the chat, and also oh, hedge parsley. Oh yes, hedge parsley. I hate hedge parsley. Yeah. Oh. And Tracy, do we have one for puncture vine as well? There it is. Yes. Okay. Ask and you shall receive. Yeah, everybody should put that uh, ipm.ucanr.edu uh, on their links for, for finding stuff. Okay, that is the last of the questions that I see. Doris, are we, you're my timekeeper. Um, we're, we're probably at the end. It is 10, 11. And um, I guess, thank, thanks to everyone who attended. I hope this was educational and informative for you and that you'll come back for our next classes. We'll be doing grafting in February and small space gardening in March. So I'm looking forward to seeing you then. Thanks so much, everyone. Don't, Thank you, everybody. Don't forget to go out and find some scion wood from your favorite neighbor's fruit tree.